Hello and welcome to Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen. We have a great show for you tonight. We're going to do stuff the old-fashioned way. Here's our lineup. A lot of people are talking about bees and getting started. We're going to tell you how to do that. We're going to have a series on how to start your own beehives. Very complicated process, but challenging, interesting, and at the end of the year, you have your own honey. It's wonderful to eat, and it fights allergies. And one jar at a time. That's the way I like to make stuff. We're going to make kraut with Bobby Joe and his wife. Oh my goodness, it's delicious. We're gonna stop by and visit them in a little bit. But first of all, do you remember making pickles back in the old days? Do you remember your grandmother's pickle jar sitting on the counter? Remember she let them set and ferment for a couple days? I found an old, 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 old fashioned recipe for pickles. Now, the pickles you get in the store nowadays, if you knew the process that they went through, if you knew all the preservatives and the nasty stuff you put in them, you probably wouldn't wanna eat them. I found a recipe, a really, 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 really old, old recipe that a woman found from her great-grandmother's book, the way they used to make them. So simple, you can't hardly believe it. Let me tell you what it's involved. First of all, here's what they look like. Now, this is only four days out. See the jar? See just a little cloudy look? How you remember as a kid? The smell. Mm. Now, that's a good pickle. Doesn't taste like your average pickle. You can still taste the cucumber, but all the wonderful spices you put in it makes it wonderful. It's so simple. I just went to the garden. I just got my pickles. I cut them so they'll just fit in the jar and leave me some space in the top, about an inch. I'm gonna pack these in here. Just packing our pickles in. I'm gonna get as many in here as I possibly can. And this recipe is so simple, you can't believe it. Now, here's all you have to do. Here's the amazing part. I'm gonna take two cups of water, and in this two cups of water, I'm gonna dissolve one tablespoon of sea salt. Now, your salt's dissolved, again, two cups, or just enough. All right, now you wanna make sure that you have enough in the top so your spices can be underwater. I'm gonna take about two large cloves of garlic. I may put a little bit more in that because I like my pickles garlicky. Now, I'm also gonna take a half a teaspoon of coriander seeds. I'm gonna take a quarter of a teaspoon of mustard seed, a quarter of a teaspoon of peppercorn, a dash of red chili flakes, red pepper flakes. Now, I'm gonna take the tops of my dill as the flavor, obviously, that you need for dill pickles. It all in there, and guess what? You look at how easy that is right there. And again, we're gonna put a full screen up right now to show you the very simple ingredients. Now, the last and final touch is you saw me out pulling some oak leaves. Now, tannins will help keep things crisp. Instead of putting some kind of chemical in there, we're just gonna take some oak leaves and slide down in here, put the top on loosely, take it, and I set it inside where it's air conditioned. I don't try to put, put it where it's somewhere warm. And you let these set in that bowl. Now, in about three days after that's set in that bowl, that's when you start tasting them and get them to your liking. If you want them to set a little longer, Try them the fourth day if they don't have enough taste in them. If you like more cucumber taste, you don't have to set them as long. And you'll know when you get them just like you like them. Mmm. That's a good pickle right there. Now, once I get them like I want them, straight to the refrigerator. I don't leave pickles sitting around all year long anyway. So these, you pretty much have to eat within six months and they have to be refrigerated. That's the only drawback to these but they are delicious and a lot more healthy than what you get in the store. Now, something I've been fascinated for years is bees and beekeeping. The whole process takes a while to get started, but find somebody who knows what they're doing, find you a good place to buy supplies. There are clubs and folks who would love to help you get started, and the end process is you getting your own honey out of your own hives. How can it get any better than that? Alan Martin. 
Hey We're there. almost neighbors. Almost, not too now, far away from each other. We got talking on Facebook. I set up more shoots off of Facebook from folks who are interested in anything that has to do with the old fashioned ways or anything that has to do with nature, so on and so forth, right. and bringing food to the table in some shape, form, or fashion. Now today we're going to talk about bees. As I came in, I saw you had all kinds of beehives out here, and I've mm -hmm. talked to you. You're a bee guy. Yeah. I'm going to ask you some very topical questions because a lot of people are asking me, "How do you start a beehive?" And I'm like, "I don't know. Let's ask Alan." All right. <laughs> so today I'm going to ask you, "How in the world would you get started in the bee business?" I mean, it just say you wanted to do it for your own production, just to have right. enough honey for your family. Well, first thing you need to get is you can get a starter kit. You can actually buy starter kits, or you know you can put a hive together yourself. Where do you get something? Where do you get a starter kit? Well, the easiest thing I did was just get online, look right. up bee supplies. Uh, there's some local bee supply houses you can go to and buy them. Uh, there's all types of supply houses online you can order from, stuff like that. Uh, a lot of times you get to asking around, you'll find someone that's got bees, and they'll be willing to give you a hive, you know, just yeah. a lot of times. So what does a hive consist of, or a starter kit? Well, this here is a brood box. Okay. All right, and the, being brood, that's what uh, the, the young ones are raised in. The queen will stay down there and that's what she'll lay. What you'll do is put foundation wax in it. Gotcha, so that's, this is actual wax? That's, that's actual bees wax that okay. uh, uh, people will harvest, they'll send it off and they make these uh, foundations out of them. All right, now, obviously, you got your starter box, you got your frames, but where are you gonna get the bees? Well, I personally like to try to catch a wild swarm. Get right. a phone call, someone says, you know, I got bees in my backyard, or on my house, garage, Does that happen, tree. is that pretty common? Pretty common in the spring. Right now, you know, it, it's, it's slowed off now, but in the spring, uh, it happens quite a bit. There for a while, uh, a friend of mine and myself, we were going about every other day getting a swarm of bees somewhere. That in itself sounds pretty crazy to a lot of people. Bees sting. And it's a very unpleasant sensation. When you yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I don't like it. Yeah, if, if you're full of bees, you're, you're going you to get stung. You're going to get stung. There's no way out Now, there. when they swarm, explain, if you will, for those who have absolutely no idea what a swarm is, what is a swarm? Uh, well, what will happen is, uh, when they get so many bees, they'll produce a new queen. They'll form a queen cell. Uh, it's a special cell that they put in there and they feed it what they call royal jelly. It's a special type of honey blend that will form a queen. The new queen will hatch out. She will uh, uh, fly out. Well, what's, what's, the new, what's the old queen thing well, about that, the That's where we're getting ready to get okay, to. Okay, all right. Yeah, the, the new queen will fly out, find a mate, mate, come back. When the new queen comes back, she boots the old queen out. Really? How does she do yeah, that? Well, it's just, just natural instinct. I mean, does she, she physically out. attack that or does do the other ones? Or uh, it, She just knows when it comes back that it's, it's time for me to leave. Time you know, to go. Time to go. So uh, she'll leave and can take up to half the bees with her. They'll come out and swarm around, land in a tree somewhere, ball up, and uh, got scouts running around looking for a hole in the house or something like that to start a new hive. And once one finds a place to start a hive, it'll come back and say, come on, guys, let's go. And then I'll just... Take now, off. they communicate in a very unusual manner. Do they do their little dance? They do a little the dance. Yeah, do a little dance, shaking their tail, you know, flapping the wings. And somehow or another, they can, he does, he turns around and does yeah, this or that. The direction of the sun, they use the sun and stuff like that. And they they know where to go, which yeah. to, to us, it just boggles the mind. Yeah, he can actually take, if I had a hive set right here and moved it 30 feet over there, the bees that are out are going to come back to this spot looking for the hive because they've located the hive with this tree, that fence they will not go back to that box. Wow. So when you, if you move a hive, you need to move it at least two, two and a half miles away in order for them to come back to the box. Son of a gun. So the old queen is out. Mm -hmm. They're looking for a place to go. That's they where I get swarm. my phone call. That's where I get my you phone call. You get your phone call. At that point, what do you do? Uh, well, if they're on a limb, typically I'll, I'll take a box with me. We'll go up there. I've got a friend of mine goes. We'll either cut the limb, just lay the limb in the box, or you can actually grab it and just give it a shake and it'll all fall right off in the box. Queen included. Queen included. Now, at this point, I'm supposed you got some kind of protective gear on. Uh, typically, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> typically? typically? Typically. I mean, actually, when they're swarming, they're not, not really aggressive. They have nothing to protect. There's no food there. There's nothing like that. I mean, you can actually, if you wanted to, theoretically, you could go over and just grab the bees and move them with your bare hands. I don't like getting stung. I don't want to take that chance, so typically I don't do that. I mean, all right, that's all fascinating yeah. to me, but I would prefer that you do that. Yeah, yeah, typically I got the gloves and the, and the jacket on. Now, you've got a shop back here hooked up to mm -hmm. some kind of device. What is that exactly? That's what we use if uh, someone calls and they've got a swarm that's in the uh, wall of their house or garage or something like that. We'll go in there and pull it out. And uh, what this does is actually when we start it up, it creates a vacuum in this box. Mm -hmm. Inside this box, 
we have. Another little box. Well, so what we'll do, we'll pull the bees into here. This box has a vent on it, so it doesn't pull real hard. It just barely pulls the bees in, so we don't hardly lose any bees, you know, being damaged coming through the hose. Right. Once it gets full, we'll close it up, pull it out. There's our bees. And there's your bees. You take bees. them back and put them take in Take them back and put them right in the hive. Obviously, you're not doing this just because you like to watch bees. You like the yeah. end product, which is honey. Which is the honey. Which is terribly good for you, and it doesn't spoil. Right, it will keep forever. I mean, the worst, the worst honey will do is it can turn to sugar, which a yeah. little hot water bath, you're back that's to, done. Back you're back to you you're good to go. Now, tell us, if you will, how these bees make honey and why. They make honey to pr produce food for them through the winter. What they'll do is they'll go out and collect pollen, nectar from the, the plants, and uh, basically bring it back. And once they've got a, a frame drawn out, uh, they'll just basically, it's, it's, it's bee spit, if you want to look, look at it that way. I mean, they, they'll take it in and then they, uh, put it back into the to the frame, and that's their food for the winter. It's, it's food for that's them. That's how they survive. Now, obviously, they're bringing all this stuff back, and they're making food for themselves, and later, food for you. Right. But at some point in time, you have to come out and collect this, and how does that work? Uh, we'll have a super, what they call a super set on top of this, which is a little, a, a little shorter. What we'll do is come in, take a smoker, push the bees down, because the, 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 the smoke will calm the bees, and they'll move away from it put smoke in the top of the box, it'll push them down a little bit, basically pull it off, and put the lid back on, and we've got, you know, up to, you can get up to 10, 10 pounds of honey per frame. You're kidding me. Now what's he doing right now, Alan? Explain. He's uh, pulling some frames out of that super he's got on top, that little small box you can see on top there, mm -hmm. uh, checking to see how much they've got the frames drawn out and how much honey that they're putting in it. What you want to do is, uh, when you do these, you notice most of these here have got two boxes. Right. That's the brew boxes. That's basically your hive right there. Uh, once they get those filled up with honey, then you'll start putting the supers on because you know, the bees will just keep filling and filling. Wow. Well, there you go. That's what you want right there. The hive to hive has its own personality. Hive to hive and day to day. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's like anybody, you know, sometimes you get up in a good mood, sometimes you get up in a bad <laughs> mood. I guess it's the same way with bees, you know. But you sit down at a red hive, you just don't want to get around to something. Yeah, they, they're, they're, they, uh, they don't just fly out, they roll out. I mean, when they come out, they're all, they're, they're Now, they're this packing. is, now when you're making, when you're doing your honey, is do you start like this? You leave it uh, in the wax or do you get, how do you get well, it out of the wax? Actually, what we got, it got a little tool they call the, a decapping tool. Gotcha. And it will scrape these little white caps off here. Mm -hmm. Basically, this is, is full of honey. Is and that ready for? Uh, this are you this, this is that? ready. You could harvest this if, uh, wow. if all of them are full. What you do is you'll check, and once they get all of them full, uh, being the time of the year it is right now, if once they got this one full, you could come back and put another one on top since they're filled this one up so well. You know, wow. you can you can leave it on there, and you don't have to harvest it every time it's full. You can actually put another super on top of it if you want to. That to me is just that's, amazing. That's full of liquid gold. You could uh, check the weight on that. I mean, that's. Oh my goodness! I wasn't expecting that. That weighs a couple pounds. Yeah, that's, that's pretty heavy right there. You figure you got, you got nine of these in a box. Obviously, bees go out and pollinate anything that has pollen, mm -hmm. which to some folks, pollen really messes them up. Oh, yeah. And Kentucky is the worst place in the world to have allergies because everything in the world has pollen. In. That, if taken every day, I suppose would help with that if you have a local. I've got people that uh, actually come get honey here local uh, every morning when they get up, kind of like a cup of coffee tablespoon of honey every morning religiously. No kidding, and, and it uh, helps them out. Oh, it helps them out, yeah. And uh, you know, the, the, the closer to where they are uh, from where the uh, honey come from, the better it is because that's, that's where all the flowers that's is at. the pollen that they're that's dealing with. That's the pollen that they're dealing with at home. What's it gonna cost somebody to, to get started? If you bought a pre-made kit and everything, you know, if you buy everything together, you're looking at roughly 300 bucks, two to 300 that's bucks, you know? And, 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 it, and it sounds expensive, you know, which, you know, I don't have 300 bucks just to throw away, but uh, you know the return that you get on that once you get set up and going, you know, is it, worth it to me. I want to thank you so much for talking you're with welcome. us today and sharing information with folks out there who might want to do that themselves. No, you're welcome. Thank you very much. All right. Now one jar at a time. I like that kind of canning, and we're going to visit with Bobby Joe and Lois Ellis, and we're going to talk about sauerkraut, putting up your own sauerkraut one jar at a time. We are 
right outside the garden of the famous gardener, Bobby Joe Ellis. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. <laughs> and you, you know what? One of my favorite things to eat at any given time of the year is sauerkraut. Okay. And you were telling me about the whole process. Now, different people do it different ways. Some people used to put it in these big vats and let it bubble and boil. Big, used to put it in the big crock. Right. But we don't do that anymore. But our ancestors did. Right. Yeah. You've got it down to a simple science. And first of all, you've got to grow it yeah. in Bobby Joe's garden. It looks mighty good. That's mighty good looking cabbage. Now tell us, uh, step us through the process if you will. I see you got a food processor here. Yes. And we cut the, we'll cut this up into smaller pieces to, to where it will go through the processor. You know, in the old days, there, we, didn't have, we didn't have refrigeration like we did. It. People right. looked for ways to, to store their vegetables, and this was one way you could put cabbage up and have it year-round. Right. Exactly right. Without having to worry about refrigeration. And so you use everything but the, but the core of that, yeah, every and, bit of it. And a lot of people cut the core out and put it on the inside of that. And really? the, the children will hunt for that when they get ready to eat crowd. No kidding. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly right. So we got a we got a nice size bowl. How much will that make? A couple jars? Uh, about I'd say four. Four jars. Yeah. Now in your garden that we saw here, you have a row of cabbage. Right. Now you will, will you plant lake cabbage too? Yeah. I'll plant uh, fall cabbage and uh, broccoli and cauliflower. Gotcha. So we take this inside now, and we figure out where we pack that into jars. Right. And that's up to Lois. Uh, you got that right. That's, that's all hard. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'll hand that to you, and let's go inside and see what Lois is going to do. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Lois Ellis, we have graduated to the kitchen. We've come from outside. He keeps all the mess out there, which I'm, I'm sure you I prefer. Appreciate. Yeah, I absolutely. appreciate that. He does that when he's making tomato juice or whatever. He does. He leaves a mess out there, and that's how you all have been successfully married for as long as you have. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe so. That's part of the reason. <laughs> that's part of the reason. Now, I like to see families working together. And you know, part A is out here, part B, C, D, E to Z is in here. Mm -hmm. Now, we're obviously making kraut. Mm -hmm. In the old days, people used to use crocs and all. You don't have to do that nowadays. You've got your ways figured out. But one thing I'm curious about is I was talking to your husband and son, and they were talking about the signs. Mm -hmm. Now, there's calendars where you can look at these signs, and there's uh, almanacs, farmer's almanacs, things like that. That's correct. What are the signs uh, when it has to do with, with, with this? What do you want to do when you're making your sauerkraut? You want to make sauerkraut when the signs are uh, in the light of the moon and not below the heart. Any sign from the top of the head to the heart is fine, and your kraut will stay white and crisp if you do that. And when you get below that, uh, it will get soft and turn color, kind of brownish. Without fail, every time. It, it always has for us. What's, what, is this gonna be a little darker because of the signs, this particular batch of kraut? Yes, last week, I think uh, about uh, the 14th was the last day that it was in the heart, and it went below the heart the 15th. You got your jars sterilized. Yes, I have. Caps and <laughs> lids, everything's ready to go. Now what do we do? Okay, we're gonna put a teaspoon of canning salt in the bottom of every jar, and that's our preservative. And that's your preservative, and you're just gonna pack that as full as you can possibly get it. As full as I can possibly get it. And we like to put some of the stalk in there. The children like to find pieces of the stalk in there. Do they get a prize? <laughs> <laughs> well, they think that's the prize. <laughs> They've all, all our children have always enjoyed that. And now the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren enjoy that. Now with this kraut, it has to kind of ferment a little bit. So mm -hmm. you're gonna get a little smell, you're gonna get something just a little bit different. Tell us the process of once you pour your hot boiling water and what happens after that. Okay, uh, then you seal it and, mm -hmm. and you, you put it somewhere in a dark place. Uh, we have put it under the house. And we, we put ours now out in the garage in cabinets that's real dark. 
And I'm putting that knife down in there. That'll give me some more room for my boiling, boiling water. Boiling water that I'm going to pour over it right, right now. And I'll pour water just all the way up to the top. Right. Now, in the process, while it's tucked away in the dark somewhere, um, some of this water will boil out. Mm -hmm. So do you need to put something underneath it that'll catch that water? Uh-huh, it'd be good if you set it on uh, paper or something like that because a little of the water will come out. And, and you've got just a little bit of, of dark right on the top. It's good, but it's not pretty. As, this, uh, as you put this in, in a dark place, temperature-wise, can it be hot, cold, whatever? Does it matter temperature-wise? or Somewhere where it won't freeze. Gotcha. So temperature, if it gets hot out in your garage or wherever, that's fine. Uh-huh. And that allows some of that fermentation. Now, it's not going to seal, right? Well, it may seal in the beginning, but once that seal breaks loose, that's no problem, correct? That's right. That's no problem. Uh, when you get it this winter, your, uh, your lid will be loose, probably. Uh, and you'll think, oh, is that good or not, if you haven't done this before, but it will always be good. Now, I would imagine that your jars don't last too long because it's so good. So, <laughs> last, I mean, last year's is pretty much going to be gone shortly, or do you have some left from last year? Uh, we have 12 jars. 12 jars. That, that's, uh, and I'm giving you one, so now mm -hmm. we have 11. Now, how long can that last? Usually, I mean, if I'm making sauerkraut, I'm going to eat it all the first season. Mm -hmm. and I'll have my, is that kind of the way you plan it, to have all of it eaten by the next year? That's right. So you wouldn't want to keep it two or three years, you think, probably that first year? No, no, I wouldn't want to keep it any more than two years. Gotcha. So that is so simple. And Lois, I like simple. Oh, well, we do too. Because I'm a simple man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's run through it one more time. Okay. Grow your cabbage. Even if you don't have your cabbage, Go to farmer's market, or so you can do this yourself. We have done that. Yeah. We have done that. We so know, done that. and it's nice to know where you get it sometimes. Mm -hmm. If your neighbors raise it, maybe trade them some tomatoes or however that works. Bring your cabbage get outside, mm -hmm. put it through the food processor, mm -hmm. get it like that, bring it in, have your, your jars are already sealed. Uh -huh. Tell us again from that point on. Okay, the jars, uh, you have them sterilized, sterilized and ready, and your water boiling. You put the teaspoon of salt in Canning the jar. Salt. Canning salt. Uh huh, and uh, and then you tamp the jar just as tight as you possibly can, and put the boiling water over that, and seal it, and put it somewhere for it to work. Where you don't mind smelling it. That's bit. right. <laughs> That's right, and in a dark place. In a dark place. Uh huh. Now we're going to talk more about these signs because I find that fascinating, and it's a very involved process. And uh, uh, your son Matt has a, a calendar from Big Three Tractor, mm -hmm. and they print this, and the signs are on them. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. ways and places to find these things, and you have put me on a mission now to find out more about this. So that's a, that will be an upcoming segment. You can't go wrong with that. Oh yeah, I mean, signs are biblical. Yes, and, and you can't go wrong with that. Well, I'll tell you what, I appreciate the tip on that, and we'll get to going on that. And how do you like to fix your sauerkraut when you have it? Oh, we like to uh, fix it with Polish sausage. We like it with pinto beans and cornbread. Mm -hmm. Quick and easy country recipe right out of the garden. New potatoes just dug up and cabbage. Now, mm -hmm. not all your cabbage goes towards sauer sauerkraut. What is this wonderful smelling dish right here? Uh, that's cabbage cooked in the oven, and that makes it easy. Yeah. And uh, it, it just has salt, pepper, and a little squeezed margarine over it. Now, what temperature do you cook it and how long? 350, and I cook it for at least an hour, sometimes an hour and a half. Covered, uncovered? Covered. Gotcha. My husband likes it crunchy, and, and we, we have to, you know, kind of test it. Test it every now and then and see how it is. So just cabbage and potatoes, do you put anything in there juice-wise? Uh, no. No water, no nothing? No. Can I have some of that, Lou? You sure can. Did I'd you love for you to try. I will try. Yeah, all this came out of the garden this morning. What a good side to any dinner. Uh-huh. It is great side. In my case, lunch. <laughs> In your case, lunch. Early all lunch. All right, I'm going to try that. <laughs> I already know I like it because I can smell it. That's fresh out of Bob Joe's garden. Lois? simple but magic. Very simple. I can eat that whole pan. <laughs> well, you're welcome to it. Mm -mm -mm. Get your cabbage and potatoes right out of the garden, farmer's market, cook this up for any side. I think I can make a meal out of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lois. You're so welcome. <laughs> 
we are having so much fun on Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen, bringing you new segments about how to do things the old-fashioned way. And you are responding us and telling us how much you like it, and we appreciate it. Again, check out TimFarmer'sCountryKitchen.com and our Facebook page. And remember, it's all about good times, good friends, and good eats. We'll see you next week on Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen. Special thanks to Bayou Bluegrass Catering and Weisenberger Mills.